Hello and welcome to episode 7. Dave Basil Colia, Neil Bailey. And we have a special show this evening. We do. Um, why don't you tell us what's going to make this one special? What makes it special is tonight we have Eric Minman, and he is kind of a local motorcycle legend in the scene, and he also shoulders the Distinguished Gentleman's Ride every year, which is a big deal. It's a lot of work, but he does it well, and we have a great time, and we raise money, and, you know, it's, uh, it's coming up, so we definitely want to cover that. Well, he actually raises a lot of money, and he gets a lot of people out, and he gives everybody a really good time. So that's going to be kind of an important news segment, and then we're going to roll our sort of shameless plug and interview into one, and um, yeah, tell us about our special guest. Well, there he is. He just, he just walked through the he door right when we filmed. He just walked into the studio. You're in the right place, sir. We have none other than Nate Hamlin proprietor of Tutopia and the folks who watch our show, all 14 of them, know him from Get Off My Lawn. Where well, he it's, spews, only four, huh? it's only 14 because your mother watches, I think it's just 13. 13 plus mom. But seriously, Nick Hamlin in the house. So tonight you're going to find the kinder, gentler side of Nate Hamlin, not just the uh, spewing vitriolic angry small businessman. All right, so as promised, we have Eric Menman uh, here with us to discuss the Distinguished Gentleman's Ride. We'll just talk a little bit about, you know, the ride and uh, get you a little more backstory on it. So this upcoming year, 2020, will be the ninth year that we've done the DGR. Not only the DGR in Charlotte, but the actual whole organization when it's become the Distinguished Gentleman's Ride started in 2012. So it's nine years for the entirety of what it became today and for Charlotte. Um, kind of an interesting story of how all this came about and how I became the guy. So, back in the day, you know, this is my bike right here, or one of them. Um, I've always been into the vintage and modern classics and stuff like that. Me and my good buddy, uh, we got into Vespas. So, I was, you know, out on Craigslist one day, I found this really sweet 1977 Vespa factory attached sidecar, the whole nine yards. So, we used to just, you know, bar hop on those things in Charlotte and have some fun. He put a sidecar in his Vespa and we were just doing our own damn thing, right? So we found out about this whole Distinguished Gentleman's Ride, which was based off of uh, the picture, I think it was Time Magazine, of John Dapp Draper from Mad Men, right. where he was like in a tweed suit, he was on a bike, just looking awesome. And um, I'm not sure really how it happened. The guy who put the whole organization together, his name is Mark Hawa, he's in Sydney, Australia. So I found out about this whole thing through Facebook, Found out about the ride. We had three weeks or so before the ride was even started that you know was going down. So I emailed him through Facebook and I was like, "Hey man, I found out about this ride you're doing. I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina, USA. I'm looking for you know anywhere close that me and my buddies can ride our old Vespas to and participate in this ride." He goes, "Man, you're in luck. There's one in Charlotte, and you're the host." So I was like, coming back, he's like, "No, this isn't not no not at all. What I was looking for, I just yeah. want to show up and go." Right. He goes, "He's like, sure, go ahead." Yeah. He's like, no, it's not a big deal. Just make some flyers. I'll put on the website that you're the host and you show up and have a good ride. So uh, long story short, me and my buddy were dressed up in our suits and we're on our Vespas cruising through downtown Charlotte. I kind of heard something behind me and I kind of looked around and did a double take. There was about 15 people behind us rolling through Tryon, all with suits and stuff. And I, just, I said to my buddy, I was like, yes, we're doing this, right? So we pulled in the parking lot at Max Speed Shop on South Boulevard. And there was another 12 people sitting there. Are you Eric? I was like, yeah, I'm the guy. I was like, I didn't have a plan. I didn't think it was So there was no, like, follow this format business plan. Here's how we do it. He was like, no, you're the guy. Do it. That was, yeah, that was the first year. That's well, awesome. since then, you know, it's grown to 500 cities. So it's at 500 cities, always the last Sunday in September. Um, I'm the Charlotte host and organizer. And we've grown it from, you know, 20 people in 2012 to, uh, I think there was 300 plus bikes, 12 or 13 motorcycle cops last year. Yeah. At the end of the ride, it turns into a, just a giant, uh, basically an antique vintage motorcycle show. So while we're talking about that and people coming together and people are thinking right now, what about this year with COVID? Yeah, we all used to meet at one central location. We kind of mingle and hang out, drink our coffee, and we would go for a ride. We have a big stop in the middle where everyone kind of takes, you know, their helmet off. We take a really cool picture with all our suits and everything. It's, just everything is really cool. Then we get on our bikes and we end at some place. There's usually a party afterwards, kind of like a celebration. Uh, last few years we've been raffling off motorcycles. Yeah. We've had helmets and jackets and just all kinds yeah. of cool stuff. Yeah, the after cool party stuff, is like yeah, to raise fun. money for the the ride. But it was never really a charity in the beginning. It was just like a bunch of weirdos on old bikes, dressed up funny, looked like we were going to a wedding. You know, just on right. motorcycles. It got so big. Uh, like I said before, it was 
500 people or 500 cities that participate now not so big you're like we need to do something with this so they started saying well you know it's mostly men that do this let's start raising money for prostate cancer so they started raising money for prostate cancer well we just raised too much money to give all in one place so they started doing men's mental health and suicide awareness programs inner city group you know raising men to be right and not be in the streets and doing crime so it's the largest men's charity in the world since we've merged with Movember, you know, where you shave your stash off and gotcha. So it's, uh, we're up under the Movember umbrella. They're handling all the money, getting to the right folks. Um, I know in Charlotte alone, in the last few years, we've raised twenty, thirty, thirty-five thousand dollars $35,000 just in Charlotte, putting us on the map. Uh, we're competing against, you know, Chicago, LA, uh, Sydney, Berlin. I mean, like all these huge cities in the world that do this ride and have 2,000 riders. We have 300 and we're raising as much money as they are just because wow. we have just really solid backers you know people that are really interested in this uh, there's a really cool vintage motorcycle scene in charlotte these guys have really cool bikes and really rich friends apparently because they're raising all kinds of money to help us with this with this event well that's fantastic man it's just it's so much fun every year and i know we really appreciate all of your work on it you know uh, and now all the people that you can pull in and, and everybody who supports so Definitely thanks for that. Um, what else should we talk about before we kind of go into the So did you could talk about the whole COVID thing. Um, like I said, usually we start a central location. There's a huge group of people, and we go out in mass. And so this year's a little different. Um, in Charlotte, we're starting at three different locations. We've got a Rock Hill start, at Cornelius uh, start, and then I'm going to start actually at Ink Floyd right here. So smaller groups. There's going to be a lot of solo riders. Um, they're welcome to do that. We're gonna have a collective end of the ride about noon uh, at Catawba Brewery in Charlotte, and that's where the bike raffle is gonna go off. We're collecting uh, a bunch of gear and, and stuff from all the dealerships in Charlotte for an, a secondary raffle. And usually we get enough stuff together that almost every ticket's a winner, and it's un, it's unreal. Yeah, I mean, we have a lot of people back in this. Yeah, a lot of rat prizes like every year for yeah. sure. Yeah. Okay, so I would say normally at this point to the main event, but obviously having uh, Eric here with the Distinguished Gentleman Drive, this is uh, more of an equal event. So yeah. I'm actually here with Nate. Nate. So this is Nate from Get Off Your Lawn. Well, it's actually Get Off My Lawn. Get Off My Lawn, yeah. And for those of you who've been tuning in and watching, I think Dave said we actually had, what, 14 people in this show? 14 and maybe like a Russian bot. Right. So. Yeah. If you have actually seen the show and you've seen Nate does a segment get off my lawn where he sort of rants and raves on about things in the industry, we thought this would be an absolutely wonderful time for us to reveal his true personality. So how do you like that? I mean, it worries me, but this way. I'm, gonna, and, um, I'm a trooper. You're going to get through this? Yeah. Right, with that fear. Yeah. We'll try that, right? <laughs> Don't keep the empties open. So what we have here is a Laverda 750 custom which used to be, well, it's not 750, it's 668, six, and there were 750s, so it's easy to make that okay. uh, mistake. Uh, this is not one, it's a 668, six, which was air cool. Yeah, and we'll get is, into that. Yeah. yeah, because this is actually pretty rare, and it's pretty interesting, and it's sort of your custom idea of what you thought a, a cafe yeah. custom bike should look like. Yeah, or maybe, you know, if, if Laverta uh, continued uh, as they should have, uh, Piaggio. Uh, this might have been something that uh, they might have wanted. Yeah, to it might have been a, a nice progression into like a cafe. You know, they're very popular today. Um, cafe racers and the vintage look, and uh, but you know, it still has the fuel injection and all that and the comforts. So that was my interpretation of what it may look like if they were still building uh, sweet rides at a Zane. So we did say that we were going to kind of roll a shameless plug and an interview together. So the shameless plug is Nate is here two Tokyo motorcycles. And that's why we're both wearing two Tokyo. Or I'm sure there'll be a huge sort of graphic thing yeah, that yeah. covers us up for that, right? And uh, you have owned two Tokyo motorcycles since about 2011. Yeah, yeah. I started it officially in 09. Um, in my garage. When you were working in the automotive industry uh, during was, the day? Yep, yep. Working uh, at that time. Uh, as a Subaru master tech uh, for a dealer, and uh, just wasn't getting the service on my Ducati. I felt like uh, I should, and I thought, well, maybe there's a hole in the market, you know. I mean, you have your dealers and things like that, but sometimes you want uh, a little more in-depth um, 
So Tutu it really so, kicked off when you fixed a fault in your Ducati in you know, right. round 09. Yep, yep. But if we go back to the beginning when mm -hmm. little Nate was mm -hmm. running around <laughs> in Virginia, mm -hmm. all right. Your dad and your uncle had a race team. With with the growing up, uh, so you had little hands and you could get into the engine. So really, by eight years of age, you're riding dirt bikes and working on race engines. Yep, yep, yep. So you've My been uncle, in this a very long time. Yes, I have. Yeah, yeah. Learned a lot from them. Um, you know, something different every weekend. You know, we didn't have all the money that some of the bigger race teams did, but my uncle was an excellent driver and a superb master tech. And, and my dad as well, and you know, like I said, I learned a ton when I was a kid. Didn't know what I was going to do with it, obviously, at that time. I just, so really, yeah. all the way through childhood, teenage years, up until going to college, you were basically building engines in the oh, winter, yeah. yep, going yep. to the racetrack on the weekends. Yep, riding my dirt bike uh, with the, you know, everybody in the neighborhood, and you know, we had tracks and trails, and yeah. you know, back then you got to fix your own stuff, old carbureted bikes like we were riding. And even like when you got your first car, it was your grandfather's old 65 rotting in a field yeah, and dad goes oh, dragging yeah, it out and fixing yeah, it. Yep, right? yep, yep. I mean, that's, you know, 16, 17 years old, uh, all my friends are getting new vehicles and, uh, you know, it, it looks awesome. So I asked my dad, so he drove the old farm truck off of our, my grandma and grandpa's old farm. And so here you go. So well, I guess the we question is, is had it, was it running when it was parked? No, oh, absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely, that's probably why it was parked, I would hope. Uh, it wasn't just forgotten about, but, uh, but yeah, 65 International Scout, you know, I didn't know back then, you know, those are like cult-like vehicles now, mm -hmm. really hard to find, um, you know, similar to the original Broncos and things like that, but, uh, so that was a great experience, and, uh, yeah, it taught me a lot, you know. Did um, you drive that car to college? Uh, I, I did not, I eventually, uh, sold that uh, because <laughs> not soon after that and we did a pretty good job on it uh, you know they started going up in value and I was like well I can sell this and get you know you know how it is to be young and you think the great latest greatest is the best so you kind of moved in that direction yeah so you changed directions a little bit through college because you mm -hmm. got your degree in business mm -hmm. you had a career in Oldest professional hockey. Yeah, I played junior hockey and, uh, you know, I played hockey all my life too. It was my other love. Mm -hmm. And I uh, spent some time uh, out west playing, uh, out of college, just young and having fun. So it was, that was a great experience too. But as uh, soon as I got back, you know, I ended up with a bunch of fellows that were into cars. And but you did have a little stint in the corporate world in between the hockey I and did. The cars, I, right? I worked for uh, a large company called Ferguson Enterprise. It was a great company. Um, uh, it's just I didn't I couldn't do the uh, the cubicle if you will. As a matter of fact, the uh, movie Office Space came out right around that time, and you know you were off to the automotive like, world as fast as you could go. Yeah, yeah. So I, I got a job with BMW, got lucky, and they sent me to a BMW school and uh, trained me at the dealerships too, and uh, started working, you know, learning all. You know, they had come out with a lot of technology on the 745s and things like that then, so I learned a lot of fiber optics and, you know, a lot of programming and, and, and things that I hadn't learned just on the push rod stuff uh, from racing. So just to give me a well-rounded kind of outlook on... Right, so BMW technology. went to a stint with Honda, went to a stint with Subaru... Yeah, 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 did the racing. dealership, yeah, then, uh, did, did a little NASCAR after I moved down here, worked for... Uh, try to do pit stops and things like that right when the economy kind of took a bust. Uh, so yeah, that's where I ended up at Subaru. Um, as the business was growing in my garage, you know, I'm starting to work more at night and during the day and you know, eventually something's got to give. I had gotten a job at a, at a place, a great local uh, performance shop called GMP Performance. Is this when you were doing Porsches yeah, and yeah, Audis yeah, yeah, yeah. and... Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and I just got to uh, burning the candle at both ends. So mm -hmm. something had to give. So I had to uh, you know, make a decision. And my decision was, let's just go all in here. We didn't have a dime to our name at, the, at that point. A good buddy of mine named Perry. Uh, we we started build. We kind of went in together and, and got the business license and everything, and started building uh, bikes and fixing the garage. I uh, did some. Did some uh, vintage Japanese early on. We don't really do that anymore. We kind of 
focus has shifted to, to the uh, European bikes. So that's really so. where your passion is at. Yeah, exactly. And that's kind of where it started. I, I just enjoy things that are different and that are challenging. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's not a lot of people here that can do Lavertas and things like that. So it just that, that sort of work kind of draws me. You know. And I think if you follow my social media over the last few years, I mean, you'll see whenever I'm down at Tutopia, you know, where else do you go when you see a 59 BSA, a Laverta 1200, a Zane Laverta, there's a couple of Nortons, some single carb conversions, yeah, well, there's a Trident a, Chopper, yeah, there's an yeah, AJS. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, uh, I mean, it, it's just a blessing um, to, to get to do stuff like that every day. And, mm. and then, you know, it's challenging every time, you know, and I'm, you know, you, you've seen the segment, I uh, get pretty irritated and, and curse and... So that's why we let him come on and do get off the line. So, so you can guarantee when he's working on your bike, he's calm, he's tranquil, oh, yes. and he's in here ranting and raving. Oh, but, yeah, yeah. So that was kind of the impetus for building this Lavota. You wanted people to see that you've got this knowledge of these European bikes, things that are different, because most people don't know what this is. Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, there's not a lot of people that know Laverta. Period. Yes. Um, you know, and this is uh, this is different to my level. Yeah, correct, correct. Yeah, correct. yeah they they uh, you know set up a factory in, in Zane. Uh, I feel awful. I don't know the exact year, but uh, um, but they started building these more modern fuel injected bikes. This particular one has a uh, Nico Baker design frame, and he's a world renowned uh, chassis oh, maker. Yeah. And I mean, just excellent. I mean, the bike handles. You know, like nothing else. They used their older engines. They were developing new technology. They were developing a triple that uh, it became the Benelli triples that everybody knows now. And uh, they were TNT, weren't they? TNTs, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But TNTs and the and the trays and the, mm -hmm. uh, so there's just a lot of history there. Not a, not as many people are, are aware of it as, uh, as the earlier models, which are the more sought after ones. So. I wanted to do two things, uh, kind of bring some light to these awesome motorcycles and they get a bad rap and this and that as anything that's hard to work on does. And then two, I was broke. I couldn't afford a freaking Jota or something like that, what are you, what are you kidding? So uh, I found this old lump in uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin on Craigslist. I had it shipped down here. I mean it was rough, buddy. I saw it. It was like, yeah, it was some of my mornings after in college, you know. Uh, that bad. Yeah, you know, gnaw your arm off. Uh, it was plasti dipped. That wasn't like a really was, bad sort of remark. What? No, it's fine. No, no. <laughs> just, just check. It. Oh, hell, that's bad. Well, yeah. Uh, it was plasti, the entire thing was plasti dipped. It was just a rat bag, um, but it ran. So I bought it and had it shipped and uh, just kind of took my time and, and uh, then had Greg Pettigrew put this beautiful paint job on it. You know what, I'm sitting here and my view, guys, is sort of the tank glaring back at right. me. And you know, Greg just does awesome work, doesn't he? Oh yeah, and I it's, mean, yeah, he picked this beautiful, you know, I didn't want it to be the exact Laverta orange. Yeah, it, yeah. That, you know, I wanted it to be progressive, so he found this House of Colors orange, a lot of pearl in it, mm -hmm. uh, it looks really good in the sun. Um, and then he cleared all the decals and all yeah, that stuff in yeah. there. So, yeah, you know, and I did some massaging of the engine, uh, cut the exhaust down. Uh, it's an aftermarket exhaust. F1, uh, that's right. The F1, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, actually got the, found the, the uh, performance chip. You know, these were actual EEPROM chips back in the day. I mean, the ECU would like take this half this table up. But <laughs> um, found all that stuff and, uh, Kind of did some of my own wiring, and, and the Ghost Strike has a very unique, cool um, front end, front fascia on it with the dual headlights. Uh, mine was broken, and then trying to find one, you know. So I kind of came up with this concept of you know making it look like an old SFC kind of wannabe, and uh, um, I'm pleased with the result. You know, it, it's but definitely the front fairing. I can see where you sort of taken the style from the SSC, but right. that is a love it or hate it item. That is, and that's fine, you know, and, and, and yeah. sometimes, you know, the more people hate it, the more I like it, you know. <laughs> uh, but 
I love it. It's it's very functional. I yeah. think it looks good. It, it catches some attention and it knocks a lot of the wind off of you. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, plus it clears everything. You know, I don't want to build something that you couldn't go out and ride and you know not actually enjoy. I mean, it's just a cream puff. It. Uh, well, you don't have a man bun. I don't have a man bun. That's uh, you know, it's so not required on right. this. So this thing works. It it is right, it works and, and stops, and yeah, you know, no tacks or man bun. You got to knock that shit off, dude. Right. I mean, really. I mean, if you want it, it's got to, it handles too well and goes too well. So sorry. Yeah. Tattoos, man bun, and crappy handling. <laughs> right, you're fine. <laughs> but uh, yeah, man. Uh, I think it's, it, it is superb. It really is. I have actually ridden it, so I've enjoyed it. But you did some powder coating on the wheels, yep. the trip, the top. Uh, yep, so and then they used the magnesium stay off of a, a 1098 um, uh, to make the cluster there, yeah. and, and that's a that's a custom gauge there, and you know even opened it up and put some Laverta stuff in it, and you know lithium ion battery, and you know all, all this modern stuff, uh, just just to kind of see if we could do it. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I think what it's called is it did go on Pipeburn, which is a did. huge yep. um, website for yep. custom yep. motorcycles. Yeah, okay, check them out. And I definitely think that uh, these idiots in the back should turn their phones off when we're on the set. <laughs> should we figure that out? Next? Yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, okay, we'll that. But um, I think this is such a cool bike for you, like to open up a conversation. Who is Nate Hamlin? What do you guys do at Utopia? Why did you build this bike? And how is that thing so cool? Yeah, right. Yeah, I think so. Well, I appreciate you appreciating it. Well, thank you. So, guys, I hope you enjoyed that. You know, the, you know, you've seen Nate around the Ray, and we're having a lot. Obviously, we're here having a lot of fun, but we really did want to sort of bring the more serious side of him to the table with a shameless plug for Utopia and his amazing skills with motorcycles that comes out of an automotive mm -hmm. life, basically. Yeah. He's not yeah. just a career, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, so this is where, when you take your bike to him, you're getting the best that you're possibly going to get. So, get off my lawn. Get off it. But bring your bike in. Good evening. I'm Nate from Tutopia Cycles. And this is Get Off My Lawn. Welcome back, everybody. We've made it this far together. The last few episodes, I was a little bit aggravated at some of the dumb things manufacturers do. And, you know, I thought about it and I was right. It's fucking awful. I mean, put the key somewhere. I mean, make a bike that we can ride. You know. But enough about that. I've got a, I've got another topic tonight, and I'm going to start harping back on you, everybody. Okay? It's come to my attention here lately, doing the summer season work where we do a lot of maintenance and things like that, which we are very appreciative of and uh, try to go above and beyond. But I just want to lay this out there. So that it may help in the future, almost like a PSA, if you will. Okay, wash your damn bike. I mean, I can't believe some of these things that come in, man. Like they just get road, 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 and then you just slam it in the damn garage. You know, when you think about it again, the next time you want to go ride. So what's going to happen? You're going to spend two hours in the morning cleaning your bike before you can ride or you're going to show up and get the fugly award all right here's a tip from your very own name wash your bike after you ride it i mean what's better than coming back and thinking and reminiscing about the awesome ride and the great time you had with your buddies by drinking a beer and going over your bike and cleaning the dang thing off Here's why it's important to do that. One, you don't look like a jagaloon next time you go ride. But two, you might just find something that needs attention. While you're washing your bike and cleaning your wheels and cleaning your chain and getting it ready for that next ride, you might see, oh, my right peg is about to fall off. Okay? What would have happened if you didn't find that. Your right peg would have fell off the next time you went and rode, stupid. So take it from me, someone who sees this day in and day out. Keep your shit clean, man, okay? Not only is it 
better looking and the bike seems to ride better but it might be a little bit more safe as well so think about that next time you decide to have 15 beers after the ride with the fellows maybe just do 13 and clean your bike with the last two this is Nate get off my lawn all right so that's the end of episode 7 it was amazing wasn't it? We had the kinder, gentler Nate Hamlin, a truly distinguished gentleman, and the other distinguished gentleman in the room, Eric Menman. Who was already kind and gentle. <laughs> yeah. And you were always kind and gentle. Yes, I am. I really, I really am. So, a trifecta of kind, gentle men. Distinguished gentlemen. <laughs> distinguished ones. Yeah, great that we learned a bit about Nate so that you guys actually know that he's not just an angry person chasing people off his lawn because it really is a serious yeah, business that he does. And uh, again, many, many thanks to Eric. You guys have got to check out the Distinguished Gentleman's Ride. Charlotte, find Eric Minman on social media. Support this guy. Come out and ride. They do brilliant stuff here in Charlotte. So. Register at gentlemansride.com. And see you next time. Thank you. Week we kind of embellished it. Well, no, last week we went on the top. Right. <laughs> we had the whole table full of empties. This, this week, this is actually an intervention. We're really proud yeah. interview. <laughs> so, dearly beloved, we gathered here today for the. Oh, hang on. So, my name is Neil Bailey, and I've uh, been an alcoholic for 19. Oh, with the wrong meeting. Hands are. Well, come on, big boy. <laughs> Those aren't pillows. Those aren't pillows. <laughs> what are we doing for a wrap up? Basil? <laughs> what was it, Superstar? That girl goes like this. No, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you gotta do the reverse Superstar. Tom, are you rolling? Two, already? one. Stop smiling. Serious. Oh, and we got up to speed on the DGR and the history of Nate Hamlin and the Laverta. <laughs> Riveting. <laughs>